So it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, who will be uh, Professor Diana Yalas. And she's uh, at Columbus State University up in New Hampshire at the foot of the White Mountains there. And uh, I can think of, I've met her husband Tommy and her young child tonight. I sort of think of them oh, as the... Say the name, son of... The young oh, the power couple of, uh, <laughs> of botany in uh, New England because they're, they're both excellent botanists. And uh, Diana started off... Uh, here in, in New England, growing up in New Hampshire, but then went to Ohio State and then on to uh, the Santa Anta uh, Botanical Gardens in the, at the edge of Los Angeles, where some of you may have been. I've been there once. It's an excellent place for study and research and presentation. And uh, while there, started researching pyrola and I'm sure other species in the high mountains uh, east of Los Angeles. There's a mountain called San Gorgonio there that reaches 11,500 feet where you can find species of pyrola including her subject pyrola picta and there they worked on um, pyrolaceae but also uh, claytonia lanceolata and her and her husband finding eight new species on what they call sky islands there so uh, some very interesting divergence and in evolution in uh, claytonia which is now in the montiaceae family no longer Portulac KCE. So uh, this is going to be an interesting presentation on a genus that features buzz pollination, porocidal anthers, uh, dust-like spores with no endosperm, and uh, fascinating, we hope, discussion of um, the genus Pyrola, and specifically Pyrola picta. Diane. for inviting me. Um, I've been meaning to get down here and hopefully this will be the first of many frequent trips um, from rural New Hampshire. Um, I want to also say before I get started that um, since um, my husband and I uh, joined the Plymouth State faculty, uh, we have revitalized the herbarium there, which was never registered with the Index Herbariorum before. Now it is, PSH. Um, so do send your <laughs> thank you uh, duplicates to us if you'd like. Um, uh, and if you want to ask about our collections um, after the talk, I can tell you what we've got so far. So um, please do. And come visit. It's beautiful. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about genetic diversity and phyloecology um, of this species complex that I spent about 10 years studying. Um, all aspects of this group, um, pollination mechanisms, um, interfertility, um, reproductive boundaries in general, uh, very interesting group. Um, you may know some of these related plants that grow in New England. Something's happening here. I'm sorry, guys. This is a. Uh, it's on like scroll mode. Oh, I see. See, it's not in slideshow mode. Let's see if we can. Yeah. Is this just a medium version? Okay, guys. Sorry about that. Um, most of you are probably familiar with uh, these wonderful uh, relatives of Pyrola picta that grow back here in the east. Um, now it's switching by itself. Yeah, Interesting. Press that little play button so to go to pause. Okay. Down in the middle. Right here. Yep. And you should be able to shift. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, well, no, 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 it's fine. Now it's blocked. No more funny business. <laughs> okay. Tommy thought maybe you opened it in preview mode or something? Or? It is yeah. in preview mode. 
It's all right now. I'm going to keep a close eye on this. Uh, some of you are familiar with these guys that grow back uh, east here. Uh, striped wintergreen is a close relative in uh, what used to be the Pyrolaceae, um, now considered a subfamily of Ericaceae. Uh, Monotropa uniflora, uh, the ghost plant, is in the Monotropoidae, also considered a subfamily of Ericaceae. Um, and uh, Pyrola elliptica is just one of the Pyrola species that we um, have back east here. And what you'll notice is that there's a lot of interesting leaf variation going on here. This is one of the things that got me interested in the um, Pictet complex uh, to begin with. Uh, so here you have leaves, dark green leaves with uh, some variegation, which um, comes up several times um, in this clade of pyroloids and monotropoids. Um, and then you have things that don't photosynthesize at all, the monotropoids, which is um, a clade of oh, just a few genera, several genera, right? Um, on very, very genetically divergent from each other. And then things like pyrola elliptica or shin leaf, uh, which are fully photosynthetic and have relationships. Um, actually, all of these have strong mycorrhizal relationships. Um, and so um, that's what allows Monotropa uniflora to have no chlorophyll. It gets all of its carbon from fungal hosts underground, which is very cool. Uh, the group that I study, the Pyrola picto species complex, is shown here, uh, with the exception of one species, a species I described, um, that's not shown here, Pyrola crypta. But I'll tell you, that, uh, hence the name, Pyrola crypta, looks very similar to this um, taxon here, Pyrola picta. All of these grow out west. Um, they were described in the early 1800s. Um, as distinct species from Vancouver Island, some collections by Menzies from Vancouver Island, um, and were subsequently um, lumped back together into one species, Pyrola picta, that was thought to be very polymorphic, but really not genetically distinct, um, and that happened in the 1940s. Um, so my work was to revisit that question about whether these are separate species or not, um, and uh, use new genetic tools. So the bulk of my work um, was on that. Interestingly, this species over here, leafless wintergreen, also does not make chlorophyll. So it is an obligate mycoheterotroph eating fungus, just like Monotropa uniflora. Um, has the same kinds of flowers as its sister species, but has no leaves. Now, we say it has no leaves, but in fact, it does have a basal rosette of very reduced scale-like leaves that really never undergo um, what a morphologist would say, secondary morphogenesis. So it starts making a little leaf, but it never makes a petiole or an expanded leaf lamina. It just makes something like this, um, so we call it leafless. It has leaves, but uh, where am I? No, you don't. All of these species are rhizomatous, and so they uh, form rhizomatous colonies. These plants grow in habitats like this out west, coniferous um, forested habitats. Um, this picture was taken in uh, northeastern California um, on the Modoc Plateau. And so what you can see is heavy litter and duff, um, mature coniferous forests. Um, these are the kinds of habitats um, the pyrola plants prefer. Now, um, in most of its range, they grow uh, in distinct populations, um, all three species, but they can grow in sympatry as well. And so you sometimes find um, two or all three of these species growing together. So I started asking this question, if they're so genetically distinct, which I had shown with my work um, using DNA, then why do we not see lots of hybridization, or how can they maintain their reproductive boundaries um, when they grow in sympatry? What you can see in this map, uh, I'm just giving you an idea for those of you who haven't ventured out west or, or need a refresher. Uh, here we have western North America and the Great Plains, of course, and the plants um, that I'm showing you here today uh, inhabit this 
montane type of habitat all up um, north and south uh, along the western mountains. So um, this is called by Californians the Vancouverian Floristic Province to distinguish it from the California Floristic Province, which is this hot, dry, um, central valley-like habitat. The Vancouverian Floristic Province is these montane habitats that um, provide forested corridors for northern species to disperse south along. And so they occur here, and then of course the Rocky Mountains also provide um, this sort of conduit for plant dispersal uh, for those forest-loving species. This is also called the Arcto-Tertiary Geoflora, less and less these days, but was called that by um, Daniel Axelrod, um, who referred to this uh, in the context of uh, this being a vegetation assemblage that used to be much more widespread across North America when it was wetter and warmer. But um, through time, as North America aridified, um, became restricted to these high elevation or um, high latitude areas where there's still a lot of water, access to water. And so when we think about um, these forests, we should think about, oh yeah, lots of water there, right? Um, so these are the habitats that this plant like. And the range of the species complex, um, all four species, I've just shown you three, um, is here in the blue. Actually, several uh, groups of plants form species complexes and inhabit this same range. And that's sort of what you'd expect from a group of plants that has such a broad latitudinal range how can there not be lineage diversification and speciation, but maybe very recent and maybe with very weak reproductive boundaries? What you can see from this um, map showing mean annual precipitation is that, uh, again, like I said, um, the distribution really follows this sort of these wet corridors that are both wetter and cooler, as you can see from this mean annual temperature map. Um, all of these cooler regions are the regions um, that this group prefers. So how does speciation occur? <laughs> On the left-hand side, and these are the questions that I'm interested in, um, how, how does speciation occur um, in these recently diverged uh, groups of species? Here we have a, this, most of you probably recognize this diagram from Willie Hennig's book on phylogenetic systematics, describing the relationship between a parent species and descendant species. So we have a single bifurcation of presumably a much larger tree of life, and um, this shows relationships among members of the same species, so um, individuals mating and reticulate patterns, and then eventually a reproductive boundary of some type forms, producing two distinct species, species B and species C, or the parent species remains the same, and there's a divergent species. Now, I'm really interested in this green triangle. What causes reproductive isolation that results in speciation? And how are those species boundaries maintained once they do form? So with these guys, I really want to know, because they are interfertile with each other. Um, when I've cross-pollinated these in the field in sympatric populations, you can get them to form fruits, um, but they do not make as many seeds. Um, I find, uh, through my genetic analyses, very few hybrids, which is not what I'd expect. I'd expect to see more of them. Um, so there's something that maintains reproductive uh, isolation among these um, in, for the most part. Um, whether that's a phenological difference, or um, selection against hybrids, or something else. But one of the things I wanted to know is whether um, climate or something about that obligate mycoheterotrophy might be driving species separation. So I'll get to that um, in a second. There are two main types of speciation that can occur. Um, sometimes we think about uh, pollinators driving sympatric speciation, where you have the two descendant species really living together in the same area or population, 
but becoming distinct from each other because they're visited by different pollinators. And so they're moving pollen um, or selecting individuals that have, say, either green flowers or yellow flowers only. There's some type of non-random mating going on um, with these pollinator vectors. Allopatric speciation occurs when a geographic um, boundary forms um, separating two different groups of the same species. And so we might imagine like a river or a mountain range causing a population or a group of uh, individuals to become separated from each other. They hang out by themselves for a long time and then eventually become distinct from each other um, so that they can't mate anymore. Um, a common result of allopatric speciation is that if this river goes away sometime and these come back into contact with each other, um, they may or may not be able to reproduce. If speciation, if true reproductive isolation has occurred, we would think, well, they're incompatible now. They're different species, right? Especially with animals, we would think that. But plants do whatever they want, and we know that. <laughs> and so sometimes they have uh, actually um, weak reproductive boundaries. Um, because they've been separated by some physical barrier, um, they may not have had a chance to develop strong reproductive boundaries that would prevent them from mating with each other. Um, that's the opposite in uh, the sympatric speciation model. Glaciation <laughs> could provide such a geographic boundary. Um, and so this is something I'm really interested in. During interglacial periods, plants often disperse to higher elevations or latitudes uh, separating from each other. So if we have one big group of pyrolas, presumably the ancestor to the pyrola picta species complex, and during an interglacial period, when things get really warm, dispersal happens so that plants are dispersing, well, seeds, <laughs> dispersing higher in altitude or higher in latitude, you may have groups of plants that eventually become different species representing pyrola picta, Pyrola dentata and Pyrola aphylla. They're separated for long enough that they become distinct from each other. During glacial periods, species disperse into valleys where the climate is better, right? We can't live on ice, and um, experience secondary contact. And so, presumably, that's where we would see these sympatric populations occurring is in these secondary contact zones. And so uh, because they maybe have separated and um, speciated an allopatry and then come back together, perhaps this can explain why there is some hybridization in sympatry, but not a lot. So the big question I want to ask uh, today, um, and what I'm going to show you is, did dispersal and isolation in different climates, in different climates or different habitats, uh, contribute to allopatric speciation in this group? Can we look to climate and say, well, uh, you know, Monotropa uniflora uh, doesn't need to photosynthesize. It doesn't really need light to grow. And so perhaps it could survive in these really dark forest understory conditions, unlike plants that need photosynthesis to grow. Right, and so we could ask that question, oh, does monotropa always grow in the dark? Um, let's ask this kind of question here using different climatic variables, okay? So in this talk, I'll ask which climatic variables best distinguish species habitats? And so I look at a variety of climatic variables. Um, and for this, I'll use discriminant function analysis. This is a type of cluster analysis that maximizes the difference, differences between species um, using just a few climatic variables. So I throw in 20 and it tells me, well really only these three can be used to distinguish the habitats between your species. The other ones are like, not very important. And what I'd expect to see in a discriminant function analysis is something like this. It's a statistical test where each of these circles is filled with points <coughs> corresponding to species. And these species fall somewhere uh, in this plot of um, increasing precipitation in this direction, 
uh, decreasing temperature in this direction. And what I would derive from this is that precipitation is involved in the divergence of these individuals belonging to this species away from these other ones. So um, this one likes a lot of rain, these ones not so much. Okay, So that's what I'd expect to see. Um, if we can distinguish species habitats using some climatic variables. I also want to ask when climate and geographic area are used as phylogenetic characters, not to estimate a phylogeny, but to map onto an existing phylogeny, do species clades exhibit a pattern that supports allopatric speciation like I was talking about before? Um, and for this I'm going to use phyloecological and ancestral area character mapping. And for those of you who have never heard this term before, um, it's probably because I made it up, <laughs> it is ancestral area mapping using climate instead. So I'll show you how I did that. Um, like I said, these characteristics, ancestral areas, so geographic areas, and ecology uh, will not be used to estimate a phylogeny or build that tree. Instead, they're mapped on afterwards, and the trees that I'm going to use are estimated from chloroplast and nuclear DNA. So they're molecular phylogenies. I'm not going to focus on how I built those. They're big, and meh, but I will focus on the mapping. So once I have that phylogeny, how does the climate map onto that, and how do the ancestral areas map onto that? So here we have a um, cartoon phylogeny, and uh, these internodes here, here and here, will all be assigned an ancestral place, a geographic area, or an ancestral climate type. Where did the ancestor to these two species, these two terminals, uh, likely come from? And under what climatic conditions um, did cladogenesis occur? That's the idea. So how is this done? Uh, free data. So you can go online and um, derive these climatic raster layers. They're used for GIS, but you could use them for whatever you want. What they are is um, data shown by this map where there is a value associated with every single point on that map. So this is actually comprised of lots of little dots, right, like a dot matrix, and each one um, has a value. So it's georeferenced information. Um, if this is a uh, map of temperature variation, you can see that it's very cool up here, hot down here. When I plot my herbarium specimens, or DNAs, on this map, the map of collections, I can extract the climatic data at each point. Wherever that herbarium specimen was collected, I can extract information about mean annual temperature, um, isothermality, maximum temperature of warmest month, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, not all of these climatic variables may be important um, for species distinction. So my goal is to find out which ones are um, and how can I use those. So discriminant function analysis, like I told you, <laughs> um, again, I like the way you're smiling about this, um, is a cluster analysis. And what these uh, shapes represent, and these circles, are the uh, four different species. So I showed you three before, but there was one new species that I described, and that's included here, Pyrola crypta. So um, this cluster analysis maximizes differences among species by choosing a few climatic variables that are different among them. And in this case, four climatic variables were identified that were best used to predict um, species differences, uh, sometimes. And so um, these variables can predict Pyrola picta habitat 73% of the time. So that means that 27% of the time um, you can't. Um, Pyrola dentata habitat only about 50% of the time, so that's a coin toss, that's not great. Pyrola crypta habitat, 94%, that's pretty good. Um, and Pyrola aphylla habitat, 64% of the time. So, um, spoiler alert, um, Pyrola crypta, uh, the reason why this is so high is because Pyrola crypta is restricted 
to the Pacific Northwest physiographic province. So it really only grows in the temperate rainforest, right? Um, so uh, easy to predict that using climatic variables. Um, I then performed a Bayesian cluster analysis to identify using those four climatic variables, um, uh, climate groups that I could use for the ancestral mapping, okay? And the cluster analysis identified four major groups shown as colors here. So the four climate variables that seemed important using DFA were annual mean temperature, annual precipitation, no surprise, that's a very common outcome, um, precipitation and temperature, precipitation seasonality, and precipitation in the driest quarter, so the summer, okay? So how much precipitation? And what you'll see here in these bar graphs is that there's a shape that is repeated, right? So you have in the green climate category, um, lower annual mean temperature, lower amounts of annual precipitation, lower precipitation seasonality, and um, a little bit lower precipitation in the driest quarter. And if you look at this map, which is all the green dots, this is a drier habitats, right? We have Colorado approaching the sagebrush steppe, um, much drier, cooler, um, higher elevation um, habitats here. So this is one climatic category, green. These colors do not correspond to species. There are four species represented in all these points, but uh, they're not colored by species right now. They're colored by climatic category. Um, the next climatic category, I guess I would say, is blue here, where you have a moderate mean annual temperature, um, moderate levels of annual precipitation. <coughs> and the reason why is you're getting here up into the higher elevations of the Sierras, but on the wet side, right? So whereas these green points are in the rain shadow-ish, um, here you get into um, a little bit more mesic habitat. Not quite as mesic as the red category and the yellow category. By the time you get to yellow, we're in a very humid um, coastal <coughs> or um, <coughs> at the foothills of the Sierras where it's good amount of rain um, and moderate buffered temperatures by fog and, and rain. So these are the four climatic categories that were derived from those um, climate layers. These are the habitat categories that I'll use to map ancestral areas. So let me show you how that's done. I also wanted to map geography. So does it have to do with climate or um, geography? Uh, so I also used these geographic regions to map onto a phylogeny to say, can I tell where the ancestor of Pyrola picta um, came from? So we have the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains here, Sierra Nevada, transverse and peninsular ranges um, of Southern California. So those are some of those desert mountains going down into Baja California. This is the southern extent of the range of the Picta complex and southern Rocky Mountain province here, central Rocky Mountains. So I'm going to use both geographic area and climate zone as phylogenetic characteristics to map onto the phylogeny. Each DNA sample, uh, which I used about 360, is associated with an area and a climate. So what are the results? Uh, two phylogeny estimates, here shown as circle trees. Um, Hopefully they are too small, but I'm going to blow them up. Um, two phylogenies, one based on um, plastid loci, so three plastid loci there, the chloroplast, and one nuclear phylogeny. Why are these separate from each other? Um, the chloroplast and the nuclear um, genomes typically have different histories, <laughs> even though they're uh, contained by the same species or the same individual, they sometimes have different phylogenetic histories. So they can experience, um, they can have different stories. Um, so I'm reluctant to combine them. Um, they're nice to compare. Um, the terminals on each of these phylogenies represent plant samples. 
And the internal nodes, where you see these little pies, um, represent ancestral character state estimates. And they're pies because they represent probabilities. So what is the probability that the ancestor at this node um, comes from, say, green is Klamath Siskiyou Mountains. Here, uh, it looks like it's a you know, more than 75% chance that it's from the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains. Okay. How are these little probability pie charts generated? Um, using information about where these terminal uh, samples are from, but also where the um, other samples are from um, further down in the tree. So it uses all of the evidence um, to generate this probability. Is it um, a weakness of this method, I guess, is um, you could get a different answer with a different sample. So if you sample too heavily in one area, um, you're going to bias this analysis. So let's take a closer look. Here's the plastid phylogeny. On the interior nodes, I have geography. And over on the side here, I have the ecologies that are associated with. What you can see right at the get-go is that um, pyrolopicta um, forms a clade here. Now, it's weird to say clade because it's a species. So I'm going to say species clade. I'm just going to break the rules there. Pyrola aphylla. All of the individuals I am calling Pyrola aphylla um, form this uh, group, monophyletic group, breaking more rules. Pyrola crypta, the new species, is down here, and Pyrola dentata here. Now, each of these colors, yellow, green, blue, corresponds to an area, and I've just filled that color in uh, to make things easier uh, just for a second. What you can see is that this whole clade is subtended by a 100% yellow um, ancestral character state, which is the Sierra Nevada. And so um, we would predict that the ancestor to all of Pyrola picta um, descended from an ancestor in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Make sense? So if we follow this from the root of the tree, which is blue um, and hails from the coastal mountains, and these are outgroups, so this would be um, Pyrola chlorantha and some of the ancestors, um, also uh, members of the sister clade to the Picta complex, which would be um, Pyrola japonica and friends um, that exist in Asia. Then we can presume that the ancestors to the complex came from the north. And as you follow um, the nodes up in the tree, you can see dispersal to different regions. So here we have dispersal to the Sierras, but also the um, Klamath region, uh, or Cascade region, and the Rocky Mountains. And as you proceed up, you become more and more restricted to the more Pacific mountain ranges, okay? So as you step up, dispersal to the Sierra Nevada mountains, and subsequent dispersals. So here we have um, the, uh, the node that subtends the Picta complex, um, with a branch that diverges and goes towards um, Pyrola crypta and Pyrola dentata, which are sister to each other. These are subtended by a node that is 50% Cascades and 50% Sierra Nevada. So the ancestor to both of these species could have been from either place. That's what that means. Uh, once you get to Pyrola crypta, the ancestor is likely Cascadian, the ancestor to all of Pyrola dentata was likely Sierra Nevada. Now, how does this make sense with what we know about these species? Well, we know that Pyrola crypta is a Pacific Northwest species and um, grows very commonly in the Cascade Ranges. So it makes sense that dispersal to the Cascade Ranges uh, may have been followed by speciation um, resulting in this this new taxon. Pyrola dentata is an arid adapted species with extremely glaucous leaves um, that grows in you know, a variety of habitats, but um, especially well in arid environments. If you follow the um, branches up, we have um, dispersal from um, a Sierra Nevada habitat to um, 
here, this is represented, uh, this represents the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains. So this um, indicates that um, an ancestor to Aphila and Picta likely came from the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains with some high percentage, 80% or something. If you follow the branch to the ancestor of all Pyrola Picta populations, we're predicting Sierra Nevada and Aphila um, with the Klamath Siskiyou. What this indicates is that there may have been dispersal multiple times out of the more arid Sierra Nevada habitat. Now with glaciation, uh, we sometimes are thinking, well, the glaciers um, extended to the south and then retreated and extended and retreated, and so presumably these dispersals could happen multiple times. Interesting to think about. In terms of ecology, uh, we come from that cold, dry habitat um, that's more eastern in the uh, western mountains and um, move up to, uh, for Pyrola crypta, um, a more mesic habitat that's also cool. So we have here um, node number seven is shown here um, as a cool, relatively mesic habitat. Um, remember, green was the driest and coolest, and then blue, um, red, and yellow um, are the warmer and more um, humid habitats. So Pyrola crypta, uh, cooler habitats. Um, node nine is here which indicates that Pyrola dentata likely came from a cool, dry habitat, shown as the green climatic category. So uh, the way you would translate that is that dispersal to a cool climatic habitat um, sort of defines the divergence or allopatric speciation of this taxon. So it evolved in these conditions. Um, for Pyrola aphila, we actually see a variety of conditions, um, so really um, equivocal uh, results in terms of the type of ecology that it may have um, evolved in. Um, node 11, which is here, is at the base of that clade and um, shows red with pretty high probability. So this is a more warm, um, rainy conditions. And Pyrola picta, uh, blue and green are both those cooler, um, mesic to dry um, habitat conditions. Uh, when we look at the nuclear phylogeny, uh, there's similarly uh, sort of monophyletic groups. When you look at these uh, sort of forks or bifurcations near the tip of the tree, I should say, um, that is not resolution. Um, the program that was used to generate these phylogenies just in, puts in resolution near the tips where there really isn't any. So this means that they all have the same DNA sequence for this locus. So very uniform um, in this species, except out here. But what you can see is a similar pattern. Of course, um, the root is a northern um, outgroup. Um, dispersing to, again, probably the Sierra Nevada, um, Cascadia, and the Sierra Nevada here for Pyrola dentata. So this is consistent, a uh, dry, um, arid habitat. Um, so Cascadia here, still Cascades, Pyrola crypta, Klamath Siskiyou Mountains, um, since that's part of the Pacific Northwest Physiographic Province, that's okay. Um, and here with Pyrola aphila, we have two distinct groups. One that has a likely ancestor in the Cascades and another that has a likely ancestor in the Sierra Nevada. Pretty interesting group, Pyrola aphila. Um, side note, this taxon here, the leafless wintergreen, um, hybridizes the best with all the other species. When it accepts pollen from any other taxon, it makes tons of seeds and they're huge, um, unlike any of the others. So this is a taxon I'm really interested in. And Pyrola picta, here we have um, an origin in the Sierra Nevada again. In terms of ecology, 
again, um, dispersal from a very cool, dry habitat um, into, uh, let's see, 26 is here, um, still cool, but becoming increasingly mesic as you um, move up in the phylogeny to the more descendant um, individuals. Um, here we have uh, 30 and 31 are both uh, in that more wet, uh, warm habitat type. Um, and those are associated with Pyrola crypta and the temperate rainforest, but closer to the coast. So um, think glacial refugia, um, warm, wet habitats. You get the idea. So these types of analyses allow you to take a first look at the habitat conditions that um, these species may have evolved under and also the maybe ancestral areas they may have come from. So. Um, from this type of analysis, we can um, guess or hypothesize that diversification um, likely um, happened from the Sierra Nevada, um, that a cool, arid climate is likely ancestral, um, that there have been um, east to west and maybe back to east dispersals. Um, so we see that Sierra Nevadan um, climate and um, ancestral area pop up multiple times um, using the phylogenies that we've generated so far. Um, and then we also um, find that glacial or interglacial cycles um, likely play a role in speciation and secondary contact, confusing these patterns, right? So they're probably going, um, dispersal is happening back and forth, back and forth, um, erasing some of the patterns that would be there if um, these glacial cycles didn't take place because they come into secondary contact um, between um, glaciation cycles, it can um, sort of erase the footprint of ancestral areas. Um, what we'd like to do next is um, do some of these analyses um, in Eastern lineages, so species complexes that exist uh, on the East Coast, um, there are similar problems with glaciation and closely related species um, that we're interested in pursuing. And my lab right now is using two groups um, to look at these types of questions. One is in the um, group that includes Camophila maculata. Um, it, its closest relatives are in Mexico, so that's where we're doing most of our work. <laughs> so like, I do want to work on the East Coast, but that means working in Mexico. Um, and the other group that we're working on these problems with is uh, Cypripedium a. coli, the orchid, the pink lady slipper, um, which has white varieties and has, um, like these guys, an extremely large range um, for an orchid. And um, so that's pretty interesting as well. So to do this work and other work on pyrolas, um, I've had funding from various um, small little places and one large grant. Um, lots of people helped me with field work, collecting all of those specimens that I extracted DNA from. Um, and I'll take any questions. Here's a bumblebee buzzing the flower <laughs> of these plants. Thank you. Sampling. You said that, that those pie charts really depended on your samples. Mm -hmm. Those plots you showed early on showed where all your samples yes. were. Could you go back to one yes, of those? Yes, absolutely. I should have put that in again. Um, you should be able to see it with the lights on. Let's do the big one here. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I was just curious, are these all uh, Dean? Uh, extractions from herbaria specimens? No. Or, no, these are all this yeah. black? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, with the exception of a couple, um, with the exception of a couple, I can't identify them. I was going to say this one, but we actually went and collected this. So, have have yeah. you thought about tapping into other collections and uh, getting a bigger sample and running the same analyses? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, post dissertation, um, I've extracted a lot more. And now, you know, um, we are not using three plastid loci and one nuclear locus, right? So um, the molecular markers that we're using now are um,
from RADSeq and NextGen analyses. So we can um, basically those few loci allowed me to sample three places in the entire genome. And now we use a method that allows us to randomly sample through the whole genome. Um, so instead of having um, you know, just a few characteristics, we have thousands and thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of characters to estimate phylogeny with. Um, so I'm probably not going, well, you always ask that question, should I redo everything I did using this massive amount of data? I'm not sure. Um, but these analyses are very cool, um, oh, and so yeah. I encourage everyone to, to do this kind of work. For sure. Go ahead. Dory. Three species we're working on have the same chromosomes. <laughs> yeah, they do. Um, so, uh, with a collaborator, a mycologist, um, we sequenced fungi from the roots. And actually, I should say that the roots of these species are teeny. They are root hairs. So that thing that you sh I showed in the picture at the beginning um, was a rhizome, and the root hairs um, come off of that rhizome. Um, they're very small, so. Um, sampling the fungi associated with these involves removing root hairs, which you can't see on this picture, um, putting them into either liquid nitrogen to freeze them to preserve the DNA, or putting them, I put them in CTAP, concentrated CTAP solution, and then extracting the fungus. And what we found, um, we, she did cloning um, to, to figure out what is the array of fungi associated, and they did share the same um, fungi. What we thought is that this one would have special fungi, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, the conclusion in that paper was, well, maybe it hasn't been um, its own species long enough. Like, perhaps cladogenesis happened so recently that it's not specialized on a particular fungal host yet. It also has such a broad range. I mean, this taxon here grows from Baja, California. Um, all the way up to British Columbia. So to have the same fungal host, I don't know, throughout that whole range. Mm. I know it's off the topic of your talk tonight. Do you have any insight on what are the barriers against? Yes. Um, Could you repeat the question? Yeah. yeah. So is it pollinators? barriers against the, 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 yeah. the reproductive barriers. Yep, yep, what are the reproductive barriers? So um, I have found one that I think is very compelling and that's phenology, but it's not very strong. So when I started doing these cross-pollinations in the field, I actually noticed that some of the flowers um, were further along than others, and in a paper that I already published um, show that the phenologies, the flowering phenologies for these are overlapping, but you know, different enough so that they have different mean flowering times. Um, after I was finished with that work and the paper was published, I found a paper on Chemophila um, maculata and Chemophila umbilata from the East Coast that showed that exact pattern. So, is it your favor? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, imagine my um, delight having found this pattern and then to find your paper and I was like, yes, <laughs> it's got to be right. <laughs> um, so, very supportive there. Um, so, phenology, that's just one. But I love these species concepts that um, invoke multiple reproductive boundaries. So, it's not just one, but it's multiple. So I have to think that there has to be some kind of selection against hybrids. So maybe they're less fertile or something. You mentioned the conclusion uh, of your talk, Chemophila maculata, and after publishing something about that species here in this area with some photographs, I got an email from someone at the university in Nicaragua saying, we have it here at 7,000 feet. Yes. <laughs> now, now, you know, the, the lowest it yep. goes down the East Coast is the Southern Appalachians and what, South Carolina. That's a hell of a long way from South Carolina to Nicaragua. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so Rydberg, um, do you familiar with Rydberg's taxa, Camophila maculata taxa in Mexico? 
No. He describes several yeah. <laughs> new taxa, yeah. and then of course, um, after he published those, was it 1917 or I can't remember the date, but um, that's what I'm working from. Oh, I see. Um, he described six or seven new taxa um, related to Camophila maculata, um, and then some others in Mexico also related to Camophila umbellata, and right. um, and so. They grow in different areas, some in the Sierra Madre Occidental, some in the Oriental, um, in Central America, and then up into in the New Mexico, Arizona um, areas. So all subspecies and different taxa. So we're collecting those now to see if there are distinct genetic lineages. But um, like these, surprisingly and disappointingly, the variation is in leaf morphology. So it's just differences in leaf shape. And so the same problems exist where Camp says, well, you know, those leaf shapes integrate with each other and they're not really distinct species. And he even went so far as to say that those um, um, plants in Mexico were um, more closely related to Camophila menziesii on the west coast and that it were more likely for a Camophila menziesii to disperse down into Mexico than for there to be this massive disjunction um, in Camophila maculata. But actually, that is ancient Appalachia. This, this is a... Well, uh, someone at the university there in Nicaragua, having seen uh, one of my photos of maculata, they actually said, can we use that photo yeah. in our publication? Mm -hmm. And so that obviously they're confident that it's the same species. It's definitely a related uh, problem. I'm they definitely a copy probably. Of, 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 <laughs> they sent me a copy of that book. Sorry. Fascinating. One, sorry, you said something else. No, I think, yeah, yeah. it's probably related. Yeah. Very interesting group. Yeah. And um, for those of you that are like maybe interested in huge disjunctions, um, this Camophila, our, our Camophila maculata, um, you know, is thought to be closely related to these ones in Mexico um, that probably also inhabit these sort of sky island populations in various places in Mexico and Central America. That's what they said. Yeah. Way up at 7,000 feet. Awesome. Whereas here they grow nearly yeah. you know, sea level. So for, if you're interested in uh, seeing these for yourself, um, you can do what I did, which is to go online to iNaturalist and look up Camophila maculata, and it'll show a bunch of points in New Mexico, <coughs> Central America, um, wow. and you click on the points, and it shows you a picture, and it's georeferenced, and so you can see for yourself um, these Camophila maculata types uh, in the wild of being, a, you know, that were observations of people yeah. like you and I. Pretty awesome. Yeah. I have an unrelated question. Cool. Uh, has anybody ever germinated the seeds of these? <laughs> Not to my knowledge. I tried. Yeah. I grow a lot of things. You see, I've never gotten any of this old with the jungle. Yeah. Yep, that's the problem. Maybe, maybe you need fungi to jump in. Like yeah, that. they do. Um, so, yeah, if you're not familiar with these guys, uh, these plants and monotropa and camophila and the, so we call them all the monotropoids, um, have dust-like seeds. Um, they've make a capsule or a berry, depending on what um, species, what genus you're talking about. And within each capsule, there are about 5,000 seeds. Um, they're very small, dust-like seeds, like an orchid. And they have an embryo, but no endosperm. And so they've got to land on a fungus to germinate. And did you see that, no endosperm, when you were trying to germinate them? I just put the seeds on, on different media of all of them over, over a 20-year period. Not one seed ever. Yeah. Right. I figured they were all like orchids. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So I haven't germinated them. Years ago, Tom Burns did a seminar yep. here, and he was talking about these experimental plot, which burned and he thought this is a disaster to end my career, but it ended up being amazing. Great yeah. Discovery that the couple like um, fungi could spread much further after the duct had been burned away mm -hmm. and deer would go after them instead of just little rodents that could only be a little distance. That's awesome. So have you thought at all about whether like, all of the fires in California are going to have any effect on yeah. what happens to your things that grow? Yeah, the fires are really devastating and it's hard for me not to um, 
be hyper curious about going out there and seeing um, what's happening with the plants afterwards. Um, that part I'm really excited about. <laughs> so yeah, I'm excited to see what happens. I have seen them, um, some of these plants post burn in um, northern Nevada and some other places um, where pyrola dentata grows and the response to fire is to, um, seems to be to produce lots of leaves all in one spot as opposed to producing more rhizomes and, and reaching out for the light. Um, but other than that, I don't have any knowledge. Yeah. You kind of answered this already. Um, I, I was wondering if you had made any attempts to correlate your separation data with the glaciation, and you kind of indicated that it, the repeated glaciation has kind of erased it. Is there any data to be gleaned there, um, or it really truly is um, not worth tracking at all it, to, to track the different periods of glaciation and branching of the different glades? No, I think, I think, a, I think um, it is worth pursuing. So he asked whether it's worth pursuing um, Cladogenesis and ancestral areas, even though um, glaciation, interglacials and glacials may have erased a lot of those patterns of cladogenesis, um, and and I do think it's worth it, especially in certain places. Um, so, and back to this again. Um, so, certain places, uh, especially southern um, southern areas. I'm just gonna scroll here, guys. I'm, I'm giving up. I was gonna say, if you hit exit full screen on the menu, or you were on before, and then it'll it'll look like it's a slideshow. Oh yeah, all right. Go. I've had this problem before. It's, it's, <laughs> eh, it's all how you handle it. So uh, there's some really interesting places to sample. Uh, because I have so heavily sampled the areas that where most of that erasure would take place. So I have done a lot of field work and sampled up in here. And that's like just back and forth, back and forth, secondary contact, hybridization, who knows. But there are areas that are more interesting, like down here, the southerly areas, or um, especially northern New Mexico, Arizona, where they may have dispersed south and then not been able to get back. Um, so I think a real judicious sampling um, mm -hmm where you're sampling much more isolated populations would, would reveal some pretty interesting patterns. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but not from, you know, these areas. You'd have to be very careful, I think. Yeah. Yes? Um, as we were talking at, at dinner, the uh, decline, apparently, in Massachusetts, at least, of pyrola isofolia, which which I last saw with, with Art and Lisa up in a great bog in, in Vermont. Um, are there declines in other pyrola species that seem you know, very self-evident, uh, very obvious to you in your work? And what might be the cause of those? No, you're not seeing that? I don't know. I don't know the history of each of these pyrola species very well. And um, like I was mentioning at dinner, pyrola asarifolia has all of these subtaxa, um, especially in California. There, I think, are two or three subspecies. Um, so that the so the pyrola asarifolia has a complex of its own um, and uh, has a really broad range, um, and that is would be worth studying. Just to understand what's the genetic diversity there, um, just as a place to start um, to figure out what its needs are or why it might be in decline. Um, there is one interesting problem in California, um, Pyrola chlorantha, which is here, mm -hmm. and um, you know is called a couple different things throughout its range um, in in Canada, uh, Michigan, Minnesota, um, grows very commonly in Oregon and Washington, um, and not in California. Um, so that's weird, definitely. Not anywhere in California. Yeah. Uh, a, a group of us have studied the Pyrolas in, in a forest just on the north side of Boston called the Middlesex Fells. 
which was set aside by the state in 1895, uh, the state of Massachusetts, and a survey was done then, and the Parolas were rather rare. But now they're much, much more common. In other words, they've increased in, mm -hmm. and, and we, we felt in, in our reporting that it was because the forest had matured and, and gotten richer and darker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and less uh, uh, messed around with. Yeah, 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 that may be so. Um, so the way that um, these mycoheterotrophs work is that they utilize fungi. Right. The fungi that they utilize increases in abundance the older the trees are. Yeah. And that's because the older the trees are, the more they're photosynthesizing, and the more they have more abundant photosynthate that they don't need to put into growing their body. So especially out west where you have these like 400 year old trees, they're not growing anymore. I think a timber person would say, this is an unproductive forest, right? Because <laughs> yeah, it's not making true. any more timber. It's Over just, mature. Yeah, <laughs> it's taking all that excess photosynthate and shooting it into the ground. The fungi proliferate and then the mycoheterotrophic plants are like, yes, I love this, right? What's <laughs> weird about the Northeast is that you find Monotropa uniflora growing everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, in younger forests and disturbed forests and 15-year-old to 30-year-old forests, at least in New Hampshire and, and Maine, the forest that I'm around is un un unbelievable. Um, so I like what you're saying, but I've also been really curious about monotropa, like what? It's like a, not quite a weed, <laughs> but more yeah, common than I'd expect. Reported as very rare a hundred years ago in this forest, this North Boston, and now it's very common. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's Brian, what I Brian, think. What you is think? Is it only um, elliptica that's gotten more common, or you know, Americana there? Or? No, it's elliptica. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. George, did you have one more? Well, I have three acres in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. When I first moved in there, there were very few miners welcome. This year, I, I had 120 pumps of it. <laughs> and all over the place, almost, almost in, in the open bark marsh. Yeah. Some shade areas, to open areas. Really? It doesn't, it doesn't pump the same place every year. Yeah, it's something, um, something about New England because uh, Monotropa uniflora, again, a widespread species, um, also grows out west, and it doesn't grow like that out west. I see it in Florida. What? <laughs> I, I see it in Florida, not far from Naples. No kidding. I find that like mind bending right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. with, with that, I, um, maybe we can continue talking next door with some refreshments. Yeah. There's a lot of nice refreshments. Please come in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.